Hello, I'm Anne. As, as Dr. Kempton said, I've been here since 2013, and I'm so blessed to be here because it's a place where abortion is unthinkable. The culture here, I mean, if any, was, any, any student was, were pro-life, I mean, if we're pro-choice, I can't even imagine what their life would be like because we're such a strong, I mean, they would, everyone would treat them with charity and be loving, but we'd all be like, we got to work on that person um, because it's the culture that makes the difference. And I know we're supposed to talk about policy, and I will a little bit, but um, the culture is what is going to make the difference. There are some policies that are sort of in the works right now, but in order to get to change the culture, I mean, we have to really work on the hearts and minds of students. And our students here, they, I, I felt, as I said, very blessed to be here because they value children so much and they value marriage so much. And so when we talk about policy, it's always with the end game of how will this affect families and children. And so any policy that we come up with, and there are a few in the works, there's one that um, I think it, I certainly would support the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, but Democrats are supporting it too, so I'm sort of wondering why. And, um, but there are some good things about it, and I think we could get on board with that one. Um, but the same people that are uh, you know, uh, helping to support the Fairness Act, the Pregnant Women's Fairness Act, are supporting the Women's Health Protection Act, which makes abortion, you know, wants to federalize the ability to get an abortion forever. So I think if we, we want to work more on the culture, and the way to do that is what I've been talking about and what all of my panel mates have been talking about is strengthening families, finding ways to strengthen families and encourage marriage. I mean, Gladden Pappen is probably the foremost person in this country with ideas on how to strengthen marriage, how to help people form marriages. Because to me, the best anti-abortion strategy is marriage. Married women really do not get abortion in great numbers, even though Planned Parenthood will tell us that, oh yeah, these women, they have four children already and their husband's out of work or their husband doesn't make enough money, so they are forced to get an abortion. Not really, the statistics prove otherwise. In 2019, unmarried women accounted for 86% of all abortions. Among married women, only 4% of 2019 pregnancies ended in abortion. So no matter what, propaganda Planned Parenthood gives us, it's not married women that are getting abortions. It's unmarried women, 86% of the time. Um, there are women that are um, living with partners and they're also having very high rates of abortion. Among unmarried women, only 28% ended in uh, abortion, which is pretty high. For married women who do seek abortion, it's usually financial reasons that um, and if you look at the reasons why women get abortions, and sociologists are always looking at that, but women living with a partner to whom they're not married account for 25% of all abortions. Among white women, 10% of 2019 pregnancies ended in abortion, but among black women, 28% ended in abortion. And marriage plays a role there because black women have very low rates of marriage. Unfortunately, it's the saddest part of all of this, so any policy that could help encourage marriage is a good one. And Dr. Pappen, I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But black women were more than 3.6 times more likely to have an abortion in 2019 than white women. Black women are significantly less likely to be married to the father of their children. Um, it's a cultural issue and it's a big problem because we have so many athletes who are fathering many children. I mean, I, in my class, I teach marriage and the family and I teach intro to sociology. We go over many of the athletes and that's, that's always the favorite lecture because they bring in ideas and like athletes, basketball players who will have eight children with seven different mothers. And it's, it's sad, but it, they provide a role model, unfortunately, and create a culture that encourages that. The saddest part of all is that millennials and Gen Z really want to be married, and they very badly want to be married. Even though they're, you know, we don't think of them as traditional, they are. And it isn't just that I'm jaded by our students who really want to be married. I mean, I, I have more in common with my students here than I did at San Diego because we have very traditional students. But even in San Diego, um, the students there, 
want to be married. They are very open about it, and the statistics are bear that out. Um, based on responses from 137,000 full-time first-year students last year, the Harry study, which is the higher education study, um, the desire to marry was woven throughout the study, which I was happy to see for Gen Z students. Gen Z students are as traditional as, I mean, probably not as traditional as I was, because I, I went to school and I graduated from high school in the late 60s, so I was in college in the 70s, and I was there to get married, to tell you the truth. And I tell my students that, and they're like, oh, nobody would say that. Even a Franciscan, they wouldn't say that. But I was in college to get married. And if I found out that there were 70% women and 30% men, I would want my money back. <laughs> I was like, this is why I came here. And at San Diego, our demographics were skewing that way. We were over 70% women. And I would, what can we do to get more men? And they said, well, you know, more teams. And no, make it a more hospitable place for men. Stop all the women's study stuff. And, but I, I, like I said, I would have wanted my money back because I was there to find a husband. And I did. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> so 48 years later, we've been married almost 50 years, so it did work out. Um, but I feel sorry for the students if they are at these socially skewed universities. We're pretty even here. What are, do you know what our demographic is? It's pretty good. I think the best were about 54%. Yeah, that's amazing. And Ave Maria is similar. The faithful schools haven't even, but a lot of men don't want to go to these schools that are so feminist dominated. And so that's a problem. So we have all these millennials and Gen Z now who want to get married. Um, so in their, they're pretty conservative in their desire to get married, much more than previous generations. Only 56% of the 1975 respondents to the survey believe that raising a family was a very important or essential life goal. That was in 1975. That's pretty sad, because um, we think things have gotten worse, but in a way, they've gotten better, in a way. The importance of family is much clearer for the current cohort. So in last year, 72% of millennials and Gen Z claim that raising a family is a very important or essential life goal. More than any previous generation studied in the freshman survey, that's the higher education survey, uh, found that they value family life, family life and want to replicate that with their own families in the future. But despite their conventional and civic-minded attitudes, organized religion continues to decline, so that's not a help for them in a way, except Franciscan in these faithful schools. This was the first year that students were given the option in the higher education survey to select agnostic or atheist, and nearly 30% of the incoming first-year students indicated that they were agnostic, atheist, or had no religion. There's also a contradiction, though. The report also revealed that the survey's largest ever gender gap in terms of political leanings, an all-time high of 41% of women identified themselves as far left or liberal compared to 28% of men. So we have very conservative men on our campuses, but very liberal women. And a lot of men are uncomfortable in that kind of climate because women tend to dominate. And I was seeing that at San Diego. It was one of the reasons I left San Diego and decided to come here, because I knew it wouldn't be like that. Um, still, this current co cohort is also a little more concerned with financial security. When asked about their life goals, 82% of the respondents replied that being well off financially was very important or essential. So this is the current cohort, 82%. Only 47%, when many of us older people were in college, 47% of the 1975 cohort of respondents who believed that being very well off financially was very important or uh, essential. And maybe some of you who are older will remember those days. You know, money wasn't important in the 70s. People, well, good, because Jimmy Carter was there. But a far more pragmatic, you know, we were bad. <laughs> Things were bad. A far more pragmatic generation, only 47% of the cohort, today's cohort, uh, viewed developing a meaningful philosophy of life as very important or essential in 2016. This compares with 68% of the 75, 1975 cohort who believed that it was very important or essential to develop a meaningful philosophy of life. Still, 75% of this cohort 
believes helping others who are in difficulty as very important, which is a big difference because in 1975, only 68% of the respondents, and Gen Z even lower, or Gen X, Gen X respondents in 1995, only 63% of Gen X, my daughter's Gen X, <laughs> um, believed in helping others who are in difficulty. So they want to get married. They want to be financially secure. They don't care if they have developed a philosophical view of life, but they want to get married. So to me, the best policy would be one that Dr. Gladden will probably, Gladden Papen will come up with for us, or at least mention. I hope he will mention it to us, because I have my students read his paper on what he's done in Hungary, because we are in trouble in terms of marriage and family. And, um, and I think abortion is the byproduct of that. The problem that we have right now is the lack of marriageable men. And um, this is not to blame men at all, but only about half of all Americans are married now, down from 72% in the 1960s. And the decline continues. The share of Americans who have never been married has been rising steadily as more adults are living with a series of partners instead of marrying. Um, and it's a problem. It's a problem that will plague us for a very long time. It will plague our families, because who will take care of the elderly? Um, who will take care of the people who mean most to us? I mean, it, the burden will fall on children, if there are children, or the burden will fall on society. So government ha should have an interest in this. And I, but the problem is, people are not getting married. As more women earned college degrees, entered the workforce, they didn't see the need to marry. Um, but the Journal of Marriage and the Family did an interesting study recently. And it said that the reason people aren't married is the large deficits, this is the way sociologists talk, the large deficits in the supply of potential male candidates. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> What they're saying is, it's really more Darwinian than sociological. Women are very choosy maters. We're not going to hook up with someone who can't support us. I, mean, I knew that when I got married. And I don't know why we don't accept that as a society. Women are very choosy maters. I went through a lot of guys. <laughs> really, and I was lucky, though. Um, my my father sort of found my husband. My husband was playing baseball in my town. He was in the minor league, and my father owned the team. So he used to bring the Catholics home after mass. And so how good is that? We don't do that anymore. We don't get people together. My sister went to an all-girls school. They used to bus her to the boys' school. We would admit that we needed to get people together. We won't admit that anymore. And it's so frustrating to me. My son went to West Point, and there were almost no females on his campus. So it was very hard to meet women. But he did fine. He's married and has children, so it did work out. <laughs> but the problem is that women are not finding suitable mates. But there are lots of them, lots of them in this room. Uh, but they are choosy. And they need a man who has a good job. They have a good job, perhaps, but men don't. And so to me, that's where the the work should be done in helping men become marriageable. I mean, not, I'm not saying buy them a new suit and nice shoes. I'm saying give them a good job. And that's where the government could come in. That, to me, is the best policy. And I don't want to say a living wage or, although I do, <laughs> our, our panel mates may feel more differently about that, but can we create marriageable men? I believe we can. I believe it's possible. Um, Catholic social teaching has advocated not just a minimum wage, but a living wage for workers. But Republicans have blocked that goal. A living wage, according to Pope Leo, in his 1891 encyclical, Rerum Novarum, would be enough to provide a family's basic living expenses, food, housing, and other necessities. In other words, it should keep a family out of poverty. Women would marry men who had jobs, and who had jobs that could support them. The U.S. bishops proposed a living, universal living wage in their 1919 program for reconstruction, years before the min minimum wage became part of the New Deal. Many states have waged, raised their minimum wage, but a federal standard might be helpful so that all these regions that try to help workers are not penalized for being just. 
Forcing someone to work at poverty wages is a form of slavery. Women will not be attracted to a man who makes nothing. She doesn't need help being poor, especially after she has children. Um, Professor Papin will, is the best person to talk about how he has addressed this, and I hope he will. But Christopher Lash addressed this in 1977 in his book, Haven in a Heartless World. My favorite sociologist, there's not a lot of us left. You know, conservative sociologists were a dying breed. And parents don't even like their kids to major in sociology anymore, and I, I understand that. <laughs> but I still love it, because there's so much value in sociology. And there always was, but Christopher Lash was the best. He described how the family had lost its importance over the preceding century. Um, parental authority had declined as the state, the schools, and the helping professions took over many of their functions. He believed that what emerged from the loss of importance of the family was the culture of narcissism. I'm sure many of you have read that. A kind of normlessness and anomie that we're experiencing in this society right now. A culture that values life can't emerge in such a culture of normlessness and narcissism. Rather, what emerges is a consumer culture that views each of us, including the unborn child, as one more commodity to accept or discard as easily as other commodities like cars or shoes or unfashionable clothing. A home is something more. It is not just another commodity. A home really is where the heart is, meaning that a home has an emotional dimension. Home is a place where children are welcomed and celebrated. Home is a place where roots can grow. The best policy we can possibly create is one in which couples are not just encouraged to marry, but they are supported in their challenging early years. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And for those kind words, she's uh, set me up for a great fall, though. <laughs> I feel like I should uh, produce a little box from behind me and pull it out and open it up and reveal the <laughs> magic policy, which will <laughs> fix everything. So, um, or maybe it could be like a little Hungarian doll of some sort. Um, but, uh, well, what I want to talk about is how we need a whole-of-society approach to supporting the family. Um, and what does that mean? What would a whole-of-society approach mean? And, I'll, and I'll, I'll talk about Hungary a lot, too, um, because another world is possible, namely Hungary. Um, <laughs> But um, what is a whole of society family policy, or what would a whole of society approach to supporting the family look like? Um, well, I want to focus in on one element of that, uh, which is the state, um, and viewing the state and government as part of society. Now, the way this conversation usually goes at kind of right liberal conservative gatherings is that the state is viewed as primarily a bad, coercive entity. There's freedom, which is what happens in the rest of society. All private corporations are express freedom. And then the state does scary things, either coercing you against your will or paying for something with someone else's money. And both of those things are bad. And that's all it does. So the less we talk about the state at a typical conservative conference, the better. But as you've seen, this is by no means a typical conservative conference, and we've learned very eloquently from a number of the speakers about how there is coercion in the private sphere, and there are also things that the state can do which are not purely coercive in the typical sense. The state has been described during this conference also as a kind of convening power. It is a participant in the commonwealth, a sine qua non, kind of like um, the, uh, the king in parliament, right, is the British sovereign. So you have to have the two pieces together, the parliament and the king in parliament. And together, that's um, where political sovereignty is exercised. So the state is not just an alien entity dropped down upon the rest of society, but clearly it's something that has a kind of convening power and ability to arrange and encourage the other parts of society. And since that is the missing element in most conservative thinking, 
well, we have to spend time talking about that. Now, normally you hear about little platoons and we talked about parent-teacher associations and voluntary associations of people are good and Tocqueville said that America is full of voluntary associations and that's great. Well, I wanna give you one example from Poland before we start talking about uh, Hungary and a, few, and a few other things as well. In, in Poland and actually all over Europe, there are large family associations for families with three plus children. There are also non-large family associations, single parent family associations, et cetera, et cetera. But a common thing is to have a large family association that is a kind of bottom-up effort. These are private associations. Usually there was some enterprising super mom uh, who put together these large family associations and they obtain discounts from local stores. That's what they do, specifically for large families. In France, th there is uh, the, this is classically a part of the train system. So if you have a large family, classically they're changing this now, unfortunately, in France, if you have a large family, then you get the SNCF uh, train discount card for large families. Well, there was a large family, there is a large family association in Poland, the three plus family association, it has some Polish name, I can't pronounce. And it existed for you know, some number of years as a private voluntary association, putting together these different discount networks. Well, that went about as far as a merely private voluntary association would go. Not very far. It got into a few towns, a few cities. Some people were willing to join, but you know, most people don't want to pay an extra 30 euros a year for anything, so they don't join. Well, the law and justice government came in in Poland in, in 2015, and at some point after that, I'd have to revisit the, the intellectual and political history here. At some point after that, they said, hey, why don't we just take this great idea and presto, make it a national program. So they integrated it with their state welfare system, and, uh, or like the state services, sorry, I said the bad word. Um, <laughs> they integrated it with the state services web portal, uh, which, knows how many, which knows how many children you have. And so you can automatically, you're automatically eligible for that three plus card. And the government did something else, which was very scary and coercive. It sent a letter to every business in the country saying, what are you gonna do for the three plus families? And lo and behold, all the businesses said, well, sir, I can think of several things we can do. Um, and now it's a gigantic program, which everyone in the country can participate in. And um, on, on my trips there, I usually, I usually try to just ask people, do you, use the, do you have a large family card in, in this country? And they immediately pull it out and say, oh yeah, I use it all the time, just use it this morning at the store, and there's a website you can find out where the discounts are. So there is a role for the state in, um, it's even in, in that narrow, limited way, short of coercion, or short of direct coercion and spending money, uh, which are apparently bad, uh, to, to do things like that and to exercise that convening and coordinating power. Well, the church is quite clear that the state should do this. Back in the, back in the 80s, though, the, uh, in the American context, the people who talked about this were considered to be on the Catholic left. They were the seamless garment of life people who were opposed to the pro-life people who knew that the seamless garment is just an excuse for not opposing abortion. Um, but if we go back to our October 22nd, 1983, so uh, one more year and we'll be at an, an anniversary for this document, which is the um, Charter of the Rights of the Family, which is a distillation of Catholic social teaching on the family issued under uh, Pope St. John Paul II. So a couple of little bits from that just to segue us into a, a few more topics. Article 9 begins, families have the right to be able to rely on an adequate family policy. I don't know what the original Italian or Latin said, but uh, in English, family policy, it's a much more common word in European languages. Um, on the part of public authorities in the juridical 
economic, social, and fiscal domains without any discrimination whatsoever. I was at a conference a couple weeks ago and one of my fellow panelists gave a presentation saying, we need a family policy and the core family policy should be religious liberty and uh, letting people, and like right to work laws and stuff like that. And it's like, that's not family policy. That's, the word has become trendy and now we're trying to fill it with concepts that bring it back down to um, standard liberal conservatism. But according to the church, it is family policy on the part of the public authorities in the judicial, economic, social, and fiscal domains. Families, according to Article 10, have a right to a social and economic order in which the organization of work permits families to live together and does not hinder the unity, well-being, health, and the stability of the family while also offering the possibility of wholesome recreation um, from the people who brought you the weekend, as the old <laughs> union bumper stickers used to say. So remuneration for work, they'll read one more, one more sentence. Remuneration for work, according to the Charter on the Rights of the Family, must be sufficient for establishing and maintaining a family with dignity, either through a suitable salary, called a, quote, family wage, or through other social measures, measures such as family allowances, or the remuneration of the work in the home of one of the parents. So even in the JP2 basically gave you two ways of thinking about this. Uh, there could be family allowances, but he's even open to phrasing this as calling it remuneration for the work um, in the home of one of the parents. And I only floated that in, a, in one article a couple of years ago and Conservatism Inc. immediately came down and said, you know, you cannot refer to uh, work in the home as work. And so I dropped it. But, um, you know, but it's just interesting. Like, you don't, have to, you don't have to stick to that phrase, but it's interesting that it is included in this document. It should be, concludes this section, such that mothers will not be obliged to work outside the home to the detriment of family life and especially of the education of the children, the work of the mother in the home must be recognized and respected because of its value for the family and for society. So why is that work so valuable? Well, because a society without children is not simply a uh, well, you know, the population of the country was 10 million uh, 20 years ago, and the population, or 300 million uh, 10 years ago, and it's 300 million today, so we're fine. No, that a society with a static population is a rapidly aging society, and there have been many books elo eloquently and, and with more scholarly rigor than I can provide written on that, but an, an aging society is one that is careering toward rapid economic and uh, socioeconomic, um, you know, falling apart. So that's a society in which there's less young labor available for active, productive, entrepreneurial, industrial work, and more and more people are involved simply in the care of the elderly, who obviously are an integral part of the unbroken thread uh, to evoke Saurabh's book again, but nevertheless can't be the main um, you know, party in the population that's being catered to economically. When there's less uh, young labor available, also uh, they can bid up the price of that labor. So there's an inflation component as well. So you know, a few years ago before the COVID pandemic, we could talk about uh, there were some you know, major economic problems in the, in the country already, but we could talk about family policy in a context where there hadn't been massive economic disruption. Well, now we have really massive economic disruption in a, in a lot of ways, um, and so by no means can, can family policy float entirely on its own. It has to be connected with uh, the larger uh, reindustrialization that uh, Michael Lind and others have um, outlined. 
So what is a whole of society approach and why is Hungary so good at it? Um, it's a rhetorical question uh, to seed the, the thought that they are good at it um, in your mind. So yeah, I, got interested, I got interested in Hungary and so we moved there uh, about a year ago. And, uh, and took our children to verify whether indeed Hungary is a family-friendly country. Well, as some of you know who've been there, and uh, when you get off the airplane at the uh, least Ferenc airport in Budapest and you walk through the jet bridge, there are illustrations all over the jet bridge of a mother, a father, an, out an outline, and there are two young children and a small child on the shoulder and it says, welcome to family-friendly Hungary in lots of different languages. Now, most of the people who are getting off the plane are lads from London on their Ryanair, like junket to Budapest to party for the weekend. Um, so people, pe pe people, say, people say, isn't this just PR? Isn't this like a PR effort on, on Hungary's behalf? Yes, it is. <laughs> it is a PR effort. Um, and you know, compare it to an American jet bridge where we offer you additional ways to go into debt. <laughs> so <laughs> um, true, the, true, the credit cards that are offered do come with frequent flyer miles attached, which is honestly a bit of a temptation. You know, there's <laughs> something to be said for the American way. But think about, think about American advertising. It's credit cards and there, you know, the hotel had Viagra advertisements up, <laughs> and uh, antidepressants and hookup apps. You know, that's what that's what we've got. So in 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 Hungary, then they they have they have had a conservative government since 2010, and that's kind of the sine qua non of having been able to put together and test policies over a decent period of time. In fact, the architect of those policies, uh, Katalin Novak was on this rostrum a couple of weeks ago, so defer to everything that she uh, said and did. She was really the one uh, who put it together, but they made a strong effort to reclaim public space. That is part of the pleasantness of a society which secures the things that are truly good. So it is illegal in Hungary uh, under their child protection law for companies to engage in public advertising campaigns uh, advocating diverse and alternative uh, sexual lifestyles, which are not outlawed in themselves in Hungary in any way. Um, but in fact, uh, the public space is normal and companies are not able to engage in this kind of aggressive advertising of particular, particular lifestyles the way that they do in, in the United States. It's similarly illegal for bookstores uh, located within a certain distance of schools to uh, sell books that contain aggressive you know, uh, pushes for alternative sexual lifestyles. So uh, these things together help to create a more uh, wholesome public space, about as wholesome as, say, America in the 1990s, uh, which <laughs> no one thinks of as the halcyon days of uh, the 1950s, and nevertheless, so in the 1990s, you had things like laws restricting when um, edgy programming was available on television. Not until 11 p.m. could you, you know, say certain words and things like that. Um, and uh, when we arrived last year, the billboards were dominated by um, uh, there was a, a beautiful model. Uh, who was pregnant? It, it was in all of the all of the billboards in the main city squares, uh, advertising prenatal vitamins. So the main advertising campaign in the country was um, an attractive model modeling uh, the greatness and importance of taking prenatal vitamins. So that is advertising that we can believe in. Uh, they have also enshrined. All of these, all of these things, into their constitution. Um, but the the thing that has caught the American public eye has been their financial support systems. And I don't want to go into all sorts of excruciating detail 
Um, and uh, there's also a risk of being glib whenever you talk about uh, magic policy proposals. Um, but I think it is worth trying to, to stretch the mind a little bit. First of all, the, the state in Hungary has done all the, all the things that pertain to the convening power <coughs> that I discussed above. For example, declaring a year of families. Why can't governors of conservative states just like declare a year of families? And then what do you do during the year of families? Well, um, I don't know, you have consultations with families. What do they want? You know, what would, what would be the better way of constructing this part of the benefit system or what, whatever? I mean, there are lots of different things uh, that you can, do, you can do with that. But uh, uh, that would be one example of the state's uh, convening power. But Hungary has put a, a massive amount of its, uh, has really been able to build a state support system around the family. That's not a luxury that we have because our state support system is already built. So any kind of modifications to it are fraught. Uh, nevertheless, they have done, uh, they have set a goal of making marriage and childbearing more financially beneficial than the moment before. So they're basically recognizing that in you know, highly productive modern capitalist societies, people have turned themselves, the system has turned us into uh, consumers who are very worried and anxious about uh, the, th the, the, th the things of this world. And that's not going away. It can't be magically, can't be magically disappeared, can't be magically replaced. But we know from these studies that uh, Dr. Hendershot mentioned, people want to have another child. People feel better when they have a child. Um, and we know that during the, the key childbearing years, all of the rest of the incentives of the system are not to get married, not to form a household. You know, housing is becoming more expensive. Um, and so the Hungarian system is basically designed to get you over the hump in those, um, in those areas and uh, get you into a car today. Um, you think I'm kidding, they have a car purchase subsidy so that families with three or more children receive a $7,000 grant toward the purchase of a seven-seater car. Um, so you thought I was joking, but no. Um, so, but a couple, just, I'll just mention, just get, I'll just give you a couple uh, bon mots, as it were, uh, insights into their, into their system. Um, they have a, um, you know, student loans were in the news here. This is what I wanted to mention. Student loans were in the news. Biden introduced a student loan partial whatever plan. And uh, Hungary has the following plan. If you are a mother and, or if you're a woman and you have a child, uh, upon having that child, your student loan repayments are suspended for three years. Uh, if you have a second child, the remaining student loan balance is, uh, half of it is forgiven. And when you have a third child, the remainder of the student loan balance is forgiven. So that is basically, you know, one, if, if that is why people delay having children. So you, know, you have to, you know, have to address that. Of course, it's a little bit apples and oranges because school, you know, public education, public universities are cheaper in Europe. So it's not a, it's not as huge an amount of money as it would be in the United States, nevertheless. Um, they, you know, they envision, it's a, still a pro-work system. So a mother who had, or a woman who has been uh, in the workforce for at least two years prior to the birth of her child will receive 100% of her prior salary for six months after birth with no personal income tax paid on it. So she will in effect receive a pay raise after uh, birth. And if she stays at home after that six months, she will receive 70% of her prior, prior salary up through age two or age three if you have twins. So. Um, so there are all these little little tricks, and it's um, it's also fundamentally about uh, getting people into homes. So they give families of three a thirty thousand uh, dollar grant toward the uh, purchase of uh, of a home or renovation of one. So I'll conclude here. What has have the results been? There are all sorts of debates online about um, 
the Hungarian birth rate. I haven't even talked about it at all because the uh, what I'm trying to show here by the this whole of society idea is that even if the fundamental elements of the modern capitalist productive system are oriented, are constantly going to make childbearing seem less choice worthy, the effort to overcome that will build a better society. It will build a much better society. So even if it all failed, even if it all failed, it would still be an integral way of building a better society. And, and you could link it with industrial policy too, for example, you know, giving a, um, for portions of benefits to parents that are spent on goods, tying those to domestically manufactured goods or something like that. There are all sorts of ways it can link in with the rest of what's been described here. So the Hungarian fertility rate um, had fallen every single year since the communist times until 2010, and then it suddenly reversed in 2010 and has gone up every year, um, rising 27% in the intervening 11 years. The number of marriages, this is, I just wanna mention these two statistics and then I will uh, close. The number of marriages in 2010 was 35,000. And the number of marriages in 2021 was 72,000. So an over 100% increase in the number of marriages per year. And you really do feel that, that it's uh, cool to get married. Like people are not ashamed to walk around big cities with children, which are, and the cities have to be safe too in order for that to feel cho choice worthy. Um, strikingly also the number of divorces in 2010 was 24,000 and dropped to 18,000 in 2021. So I don't know of any other, maybe there is one, but I don't know of any other, other country that's had a dramatic reversal in the number of divorces and marriages like that regardless. And the fertility rate went up, but um, they did kind of engineer a dramatic reversal uh, there. And the number of abortions per year uh, collapsed by 50%. Um, and uh, Prime Minister in his speech in Dallas said, we've got to go the rest of the way too. Um, so there is a lot to learn from that. Again, you know, what to apply in particular situations in the United States, that's something that again, I think will involve the whole of society. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, before I begin, I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to offer a few thanks. Um, Saurabh was sitting here. He's out now, probably getting fresh air. Um, oh, there, there he is, <laughs> Saurabh, um, for uh, the invitation to come here and speak to you uh, today. And, and thank you certainly to Franciscan uh, University, this wonderful institution for hosting this conference. Um, and also particularly for, for me, uh, being a, a son of the Midwest, it's always a good opportunity to uh, come, come back to, uh, to this part of the country. The topic of this panel is political economy and family policy after Dobbs. In the political economy literature, there's a popular typology of three models of the post-World War II welfare capitalism, defined generally by the different character and quality of three universal social institutions. Those are the state, the market, and the family. Together, these three institutions form what is often referred to as a welfare regime, or more stylistically, the three, three worlds of welfare capitalism. As this common approach goes, the three regimes, these three types, if you will, are the social democratic, the conservative, and the liberal. The social democratic, the archetype is generally Sweden, the conservative Germany, and the liberal is our own, the United States. The United States is typically defined as a a welfare regime characterized by a, quote, residual, if you will, welfare state. That is a welfare state that is oriented primarily towards the poor. This is so much the case that in the United States, welfare is commonly understood not as the aggregate well-being of a society, the sum of social goods that is the common good of a people, but instead a collection of means-tested government payments. Medicaid, TANF, SNAP, these are the kinds of things that Americans generally think of when we hear the word welfare. The welfare state in a liberal regime like ours is residual because welfare is supposed to come not just primarily but almost wholly through the other institutions, 
the market, and the family. Welfare is normatively also derived from the market, that is, benefits that we receive are generally attached to employment in the market, including fundamental elements of welfare, like health benefits, pensions, receiving an income without working, we might call that paid time off. Um, these are all privately provided in the United States for the most part. And to the extent that the state encourages private provision of these, such as through the tax code, they are provided highly unequally. So alongside the market, of course, the family, too, is a central institution of welfare production and consumption, although one must admit less so in a post-industrial economy than in an industrial one, and in an industrial one less so than in an agricultural one. Yet even in our own society, the family remains the fundamental site of every manner of welfare production and consumption, from housing to education to childcare to meal preparation, cleaning, transportation. We could probably add many more to this list. The hallmark of the liberal welfare regime is the expectation that the state remains residual and that the market and the family not simply play the primary, but again, the normatively dominant role. There's a form of familialism here but one that is more implicit than explicit, to keep members of society out of poverty and off of welfare, the family is expected to generate welfare, while the state takes little initiative and in actively cultivating the ability of the family to perform this central function. Instead, the family is generally thought of in a liberal welfare regime as a private institution, yet is relied upon to fundamentally generate public goods, those as mundane as funding Social Security, for example, or as profound as the moral education and continuation of the community itself. The American state's largely laissez-faire approach to the family is falling woefully short. Perhaps once we could reasonably assume that the family would uncomplicatedly reproduce itself that private and local institutions such as churches or neighborhoods, voluntary societies that Professor Pappen had talked about earlier, would perform what support was required to make sure that the family would persist, that it would both produce welfare in the present and contribute to the continuation of society into the future. The evidence certainly over at least just the last 15 years, if not longer, has I think become overwhelming not only at the bottom of society, among those for whom the residual welfare state exists, but really throughout society at large. These are, I assume to many in the room, somewhat familiar statistics. So in 2020, the last data that uh, the government of the United States has produced, marriage rate was 5.1 per 1,000 people. That's half of levels as recently as 1984. And it's really been in free fall since 2017. Fertility rates in the United States, latest data, 2020, among women aged 15 to 44, there were 56 births per 1,000 women. That's half the level of 1960. More stark is what uh, sociologists often call the total fertility rate. That is a statistical projection of lifetime fertility. In 2020, that fell to 1.64 women, or sorry, children per woman per lifetime the lowest level on record, and almost surely the lowest level in the history of the United States. We also see the cultural erosion of marriage and family itself. Rates of cohabitation have increased so much that in the mid-2010s, five, six, seven years ago, it was more common for an American age 18 to 44 to have ever cohabited than to have ever married. And some 40% of those who have cohabited have done so more than once. They have done so with multiple partners. These social and cultural trends are all the more worrying in the context of this panel, right? A post-Dobbs society. The Supreme Court has finally fulfilled 50 years of pro-life work and hope and prayer. And the momentous quality of that decision should not be downplayed, and I certainly don't want to do that here. The work of the pro-life movement in crisis pregnancy pregnancy centers, maternal health care, parenting classes, adoption, foster care, post-abortion ministry has been truly heroic. Yet realizing the promise 
of a post-Dobbs world is radically dependent on the social and cultural infrastructure of the American family. The cruel irony of the landscape of the American family today is that those who most lack the welfare that is generated by the family are simultaneously those who most often turn to abortion, while those most opposed to it. Women whose highest level of education, for example, is high school, have twice the abortion rate of women with a college degree. The abortion rate among women in poverty is a grim six times higher than the abortion rate of women whose family income is greater than 200% of the federal poverty line. The highest abortion rates in America are among poor women, cohabiting women, young women. And yet Americans with a high school education support abortion on demand at only half the rate of Americans with a college degree. They believe abortion to be, quote, morally acceptable, unquote, at less than half the rate of highly educated Americans. 38% of Americans who make under $40,000 a year consider abortion to be morally acceptable. 63% of Americans who make more than $100,000 a year think abortion is morally acceptable. Ample social scientific evidence demonstrates that marriage is society's best wealth generating and commitment building institution, not only for children, but for adults as well. This, I think, is not in doubt. What is in doubt, however, is the ability of American society to produce marriage and families. Countries throughout the West are staring into much the same future as we are, and it's become a hallmark of the so-called populist right, whether from Hungary and Poland, as we've just heard, or Italy or Spain, to identify the family as precisely the social institution most now at risk of social failure in its most fundamental task that is the successful generation of the next generation, and most therefore in need of state support. And yet, and yet. This realization I don't think has really come yet to the United States, not really. I offer two case studies in support of this conclusion. The first is something that happened earlier this summer, the Republican primary election in Mississippi's third congressional district. If you are a reader of Compact Magazine, you might have read about this. Matthew Schmitz wrote about it uh, earlier. Politically speaking, Mississippi 3, the Mississippi 3rd District, is a typical majority white, low immigration southern district. Solidly, rock solid Republican. Mississippi 3 includes a number of small cities typical of American decline. Meridian, Mississippi is the best example of that but it also inc incorporates the wealthiest suburbs of the state capital, Jackson, a detail which will become quite relevant to my story in a moment. So the congressman of this district is a man named Michael Guest, and Representative Guest was first elected in 2018, and he's currently running for his third term to represent the district in the House of Representatives. Such members of Congress really rarely face any meaningful primary challenges, but this summer, Representative Guest did in the form of a former Navy fighter pilot from Virginia whose name was Michael Cassidy. And he came to Mississippi because of his military service. There's a big military base uh, in Meridian or outside of Meridian. And so he became stationed there and essentially built his life uh, in Meridian. And he took up this rather quixotic challenge. While opposing guests on what one might call kind of standard MAGA Republican issues such as the Trump impeachment or military aid to Ukraine, Cassidy also made a pretty significant splash with his proposals for a robust federal family policy. And it included things like this, Medicare for all, a $20,000 marriage bonus, revocable upon divorce, uh, <laughs> monthly child stipends, and a generous maternal leave policy enforced on employers. Now, despite this quite frankly radical set of proposals, certainly for a Republican, Cassidy's platform really drew very little attention until he nearly won the election. And it was quite shocking, uh, shocking especially to the Republican establishment in Mississippi. He fell only 268 votes short of winning. But thanks to a third candidate in the race, neither Cassidy nor Guest won a majority of the vote and therefore by Mississippi law had to go to a runoff election later on that month. In that runoff, things turned out very, very differently. 
shall we say, mainline Republican interests, such as the Congressional Leadership Fund, stormed the district in defense of Representative Guest. One of their memorable attack ads from the summer urged Mississippi Republican voters to reject Cassidy, whom they called, quote, another lying rhino, unquote, and his, quote, socialist agenda, unquote. Cassidy certainly didn't help his cause either. As soon as party elites began noticing his family policy proposals, he too began running from them as fast as he possibly could and as far away as he could. He scrubbed his entire website of his pro-family policy proposals, choosing instead to become a standard issue, fiscally conservative Republican, emphasizing, as he said, quote, lowering the tax burden on working families as if working families in Mississippi are paying any significant amount of federal taxes in the first place. Uh, the, 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 the lower half of the income distribution in America pays zero in federal income taxes, at least. Transforming himself into simply a facsimile of the incumbent he was running against, Cassidy not surprisingly lost the runoff, and he lost badly. While his vote tally actually declined slightly from the first to the second iteration of the primary, his opponent, guess numbers actually doubled. This razor thin margin in the first uh, iteration became a 24,000 two to one wipeout in the runoff. Whereas Cassidy still won Meridian, this kind of post-industrial town that is characteristic of so many parts of America, he lost the Jackson suburbs, the rich, wealthy Jackson suburbs by an even greater margin than he lost the overall district. So that's the first. My second case study is a new document that was released just two weeks ago at the end of September by the Republican Study Committee titled A Family Policy Agenda and endorsed by an array of kind of standard Republican policy organizations, including SBA Pro-Life America, CPAC, National Right to Life, Family Research Council. This document sets out 10 what it calls principles and over 80 policy recommendations, all oriented towards what the document says is, quote, restoring the American family. I won't parse the document in any detail here, but merely state that while there are many aspects of this policy wish list to commend, it fails to fully appreciate the contemporary crisis of the American family. And it fails fundamentally to break from the fundamental liberal commitments in the way that I was speaking about earlier of the American welfare regime. So once the reader gets past the kind of standard culture war issues at the beginning, policies of which I generally actually support, uh, if you have read anything that I've written, um, attention to the material conditions of social reproduction are quite underwhelming. It's largely a collection of more savings accounts, more tax cuts, more privatization, more work incentives, less regulation. True to the residual welfare regime model, policies with a robust material component are targeted at the poor rather than to the whole of society. Here it calls, and this is a quote from the document, the anti-work proposals of the radical left. They come in for particular condemnation. To the extent that the agenda seeks to remove disincentives to marriage and childbearing, this is all well and good. But in true liberal fashion, the agenda provides no incentives. The American right continues to presume that the family will somehow simply reproduce itself and that the primary task of the state is to realize that signature liberal value, more choice. The American right is stuck in the same liberal framework as is the right in much of Europe, Western Europe in particular. In both the United States and Western Europe, a right position on social and cultural policy is generally combined with a right position on economic policies. In fact, there's a positive, if somewhat mild, correlation among right parties in Western Europe along these measures. In fact, there are many countries in Western Europe, Austria, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, Spain, Sweden, and Britain, not a single political party exists in any of those countries that has a right of center cultural position paired with a left of center economic position. As Americans, we might simply respond, this is right and just. What else, of course, would one expect? And yet, and yet, there is 
an alternative. We've heard about it a bit here this morning. In the formerly communist countries of Central Europe, which have joined the Western economic and military blocs since the end of the Cold War, this combination of right on culture, left on economics is in fact common. In fact, every so former Soviet bloc state in the European Union today has at least one political party with such a character. Taking this set of countries as a whole, there's a strong, in fact, negative relationship today in Central Europe between these two policy axes when measured by electoral party strength. That is to say, the most popular culturally right parties in Central Europe, that is Fidesz in Hungary, Law and Justice in Poland, the Croatian Democratic Union in Croatia, all are left of center on economics. Central Europe, in fact, has almost no conservative liberal parties after the mold of kind of standard issue American Republican Party politics. In the regulation of capital, industrial policy, and social policy, the right in Central Europe has really taken to heart the advice of this conference, the cultivation through, certainly not only, but in part, the state of the pursuit of the common good. The family is not a private institution. It's a public one. Just as marriage is a public institution, justly regulated by the state, just as is the education of children. While there are many warning signs that young Americans are giving up on the family, they do continue to form couples. And in fact, they do so at much the same rate and much the same age as their parents and grandparents did. It's just that their parents and grandparents were marrying rather than cohabiting. But this impulse to marriage remains. In addition, Americans are falling increasingly short of their desired fertility. In surveys, American women report a ideal family size, that's the question in the surveys, of about 2.6 children. Intended fertility, that is what they think they'll actually accomplish, remains about 2.0. And yet, as we know, the actual fertility rate in the United States falls well short of American families' intentions and ideals that they say themselves. This makes for a fertility gap that has even become a fertility chasm. The secret to marital fertility is early marriage. Cohabitation, by and large, does not produce families in America. Marriage does. Yet those who wait until their 30s to marry will almost inevitably bear fewer children than either they themselves ideally would have, and certainly fewer than society itself would. So here to conclude, I suggest two perhaps radical proposals. The first is to take a page out of the laws of the Canadian province of British Columbia. In British Columbia, a couple that is cohabitated in what is called a, quote, marriage-like relationship, unquote, for two years are in the eyes of the law spouses. If that couple has a child together, they are in the eyes of the law spouses from the moment of that child's birth. For those who have their own free choice, live in marriage-like relationships, both the rights and the duties of marriage should be extended to them for their own good, for the good of their children, and for the good of the community. Second, the American right should not flee, as Michael Cassidy did from family policy with real material stakes. Medicare for all, marriage bonuses, child allowances, maternal leave, the normalization of part-time employment for mothers of small children. We are asking young people to not simply take an interest in their own future, but in our collective future to establish a personal stake in it and contribute to their good and the good of the community. This, of course, is the good that we share in common. That is, at its foundation, the task of reproduction, the reproduction of social institutions, of norms and cultural values, of economic practices that reach out simply, not simply to today and to tomorrow, but to the furthest horizon. Thank you.